Hello and welcome to Nevermind the Bar Charts with myself, Mark Pack. This time I'm joined by Professor Caitlin Milazzo, who would be first in line for the title if it existed, I think, of Professor of Political Leaflets, which is why I've invited her back on the show to talk once again about her work researching what really goes into those political leaflets so many listeners have spent so many hours delivering and from which I've still got some blisters I'm recovering from. So welcome to the show, Caitlin. Thanks, Mark. Happy to be here. Now, you've got some new research out, but before we dive into that, do you want to just outline a little bit about the Open Elections Project and sort of what insights it gives you into political leaflets in general? I'm always happy to talk about the ele Open Elections Project. This comes from, you know, from a kind of a view that, that, that campaigns are changing, right? There's the rise of social media. We talk about Twitter and TikToks and Snapchat and all the things that uh, my students are up on. But actually, when it comes to campaigns, traditional election leaflets remain the most common way that voters uh, engage with political elites and politicians, candidates and parties during a general election and ca campaign. So during a general election, voters get thousands of leaflets. They go millions of leaflets go around around the country. But despite the importance of and how many leaflets are actually delivered, we really know really little about the nature of these com communications, right? So, so politicians, are, well, candidates are required to report how much they spend on designing and distributing leaflets, but they don't have to report what they say in them. So that's really the genesis for the Open Elections Project. And it's, it's really important now more than ever because of the presence of micro-targeting. So we know that parties and candidates are incre increasingly using database data, data-driven campaigning techniques where you, you design leaflets and, and campaign tactics for particular voters, right? We want messages that are really going to gravitate to individuals. That creates a challenge for, for citizens during a general election because it means that candidates or parties can often be promising different things in different places, right? So when we talk about transparency and holding our, our, our elites to account, you know, this idea that voters only get a snapshot of the campaign becomes, you know, increasingly problematic. So that's what the open election pro project is really designed to do is, is shed some light and cre increase transparency around, around local election campaigns by focusing on the leaflets that candidates and parties deliver. So before we get into the new research, I know you've been running this project for a little while, and I'll also include in the show notes a link to the previous podcast where you talked about some earlier findings from it. But so if you had to summarise what you've discovered so far in a couple of sentences, what's what's the broad picture you found? Two sentences was a, a couple of sentences was really tough, but I'll, I'll give it my best go here. So <laughs> it's it's actually really simple. There's a lot of variation in local campaigns across parties, across elections, and even regionally. And some of this variation makes a lot of sense. For example, that parties have, the unpopular leaders are less likely to feature in local leaflets. But some of it's unexpected. And that is, for example, that we know that, that voters love local candidates, but actually very few candidates talk about their local connections even when they have them. So mm -hmm. lots answer. of variation, some expected and some not. And just as a slight digression before we mm -hmm. get on to the new piece of research, because you mentioned this issue about, you know, different different things may get said in different places by the same party, mm -hmm. which is obviously an allegation that every party likes to throw at other parties. Have you been surprised about how much or how little of that variation that you you find or has it been you know basically is the media cliche of politicians will say anything and will change what they say depending who the audience is have you found that that is broadly the picture or have you got a more optimistic view for I us have, i have a more optimistic view i mean i think you know micro targeting is like negative campaigning can be seen as a as a really kind of loaded term mm. but actually i mean Think about it this way, you know, there are different places and different places need different things, right? So it's very reasonable that in some in some constituencies, maybe housing is an issue, right? Other constituencies, it won't be, right? So it, it's very reasonable that a party or a candidate, even from the same party, would focus on local issues. And I, I don't think we would really want to make light of that type of variation. But I think it's still important for thinking about things like the economy or immigration, you know, where we see candidates kind of taking fundamentally different views. It's not necessarily a bad thing, right? We, we, want, we want our representatives to represent their voters. So actually, we might think that that variation is really positive. But we want voters to be able to make a sense of how they can build a picture across those different views 
to what a party really stands for and what they should expect from their MP or, or the governing party if they're elected, right? So it kind of goes back to that classic Downsian view. You know, how can you decide which party is best able to represent you? And you want to form that not only on the local picture, but also nationally. And that brings us very neatly onto <laughs> the question about negative campaigning, because that's often seen as undesirable thing. You know, negative campaigning is often used as a term of criticism or reproach. But also one can view negative campaigning as being quite a positive thing in terms of it's a way of holding people to account. So your new piece with Alan Duggan is called Going on the Offensive, Negative Messaging in British General Elections. I'll again, I'll include a show note, a link to it in the show notes because I'm glad to see it's available without an expensive article <laughs> journal login. But what did you and Alan find in the article? Well, so, so this is a really interesting paper, and I would say that, but there's already a ton of research on negative campaigning. And I think you're, you're quite right to point out that, that that has a very, I hate to use the word negative connotation, but it does. And a lot of that comes from, from the fact that, that much of the literature comes from the study of the United States. Hmm. And their negative campaigning is, in fact, very negative. So I think that, that we, kind of, we kind of feel that, but actually negative campaigning is more than that. And, and what we want to do in this paper is, is kind of find a place between understanding negative campaigning that, that we see in the United States versus the literature that focuses on the, the, camp, the ways that parties use a, a more negative messaging in Europe, right? So that tends to focus on parties' national strategies. So what we want to do in this paper is look at how do candidates use negative messaging in a system where parties have perhaps more power than they do in the United States. So, so that's really the, 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 the great idea, the great kind of motivation behind this project. I think Britain is a really interesting place for people to study negative, negative messaging. So we know a lot about how incumbency matters, right? How do incumbents attack their opponents? And we know a lot about how government status, so is someone in the governing party or not, how that shapes a party's a use of negative messaging. Britain is one of the few countries where you can study both of those at the same time, mm. right? Because we have incumbency and candidates, and we also have government status because we often we have a, a parliamentary democracy, mm. right? So it's actually a really nice case to study a lot of different things at the same time. So we find so in this project that so looking at both incumbency and government status both matter. But it's really government status, so whether or not you're a member of the governing party, that, that really drives whether a candidate uses negative, uh, negative messaging. So non-incumbent members of the challenging party are the most likely to use negative messaging. And incumbents from the governing party are the least likely to use it. So big gap between those two. We also find that marginality matters, right? So competition, the competitiveness of the local race, so candidates contesting marginal seats across the board are more likely to use negative messaging. But that said, marginality affects the behavior of all candidates, right? So even candidates from the incumbent party, incumbent candidates from the governing party become more likely to use negative messaging in marginal seats. So basically it pushes everyone into a kind of more negative or being more likely to criticize their opponents. So what does that mean? It means that voters in marginal seats are going to be more likely to receive negative messaging than, say, voters in a, in a, in a safe seat. Um, and, so and I think that was when I was reading the article at first, that seemed to me a sort of almost intuitively obvious conclusion to expect mm -hmm. that you would find that the more marginal the seat, the more robust, perhaps one can use that slightly more neutral word, the campaigning would be. And therefore, the more marginal, the more negative campaigning there is. Although thinking about it, I mean, perhaps one should just as well expect to see, well, if you're a long way behind, you're more desperate. And if you're more desperate, you go more negative and you throw more you know, allegations around, etc. So, so I guess it's not intuitively obvious necessarily that it should be. It's only, you know, it's the closer it is, the more negative the campaigning gets. What did you pick up any sense of why it is that you, we don't get more negative campaigning from essentially the desperation effect of someone who's a long way behind? So this isn't something that that we explored explicitly in the paper, but I I mean I can give you why why mm. I think that's the case, and I think I think you've already hit on it. It's this idea that negative campaigning is is seen to be negative. Mm. Actually, it's really not right. So so you know we when we talk about negative campaigning. It's just talking about your opponent. Now, 
more than likely, that's usually not flattering. At times, we have, we have actually found leaflets where people praise their opponents. They're always from the Greens. But generally speaking, you shouldn't talk about your opponent unless you want to undermine their position, right? So, but that's not that's not in itself a bad thing. Mm. But people think it is, and so I think there's there's still a reticence to be seen to be doing negative campaigning mm. and to be seen to criticizing. The example I often use is, you know, parents teach their children to take the high road. You know, oh, mm. you, to, you know, I, I use that to, with my daughter frequently. I think it's the same in campaigning. So if you have no chance of, of mm. winning, you want to take the high road, right? Because you want to perceive that, you know, you kind of retains the moral ground because there's just really nothing to be gained by giving it up. That's, yeah. I, I mean, I think you're right that there's a very strong sort of gut feeling about negative campaigning. And it reminds me, I think the most controversial leaflet I ever artworked with colleagues was one where I used the word paedophile in it. You know, I'm absolutely happy to justify the leaflet because the circumstances were a local council had been failing in its checks on who it was employing mm -hmm. and therefore a school bus were, had as its driver a convicted paedophile and that shouldn't have happened and that was a serious failing by the council. And so on the one hand, I'm very happy to say that actually if a council fails in its sort of basic duties like that, that is not only acceptable to criticise it for, I'm, I'd even go so far as to say it's necessary. That's what we need in a democracy. That's what we need to hold bits of the of the government, bits of the state to account, is that those things are absolutely highlighted. And there's definitely a tone in which you do it. So had the, the Lib Dem focus leaflet been a scare story about parents being petrified about their children going to school, that would definitely have been wrong. But in a, you know, in the right context, I think, you know, using the word paedophile and attacking the council over it, I think was was absolutely defensible. But but, you know, and despite the fact that it was a council run by another party, so all my colleagues were predisposed in that sense to dislike, you know, that council's record. You're right. There's a really strong emotional. But but the curious thing is that often, at least in my experience, you know, people might say, oh, they hate negative campaigning, etc. But then ask them what they think about Boris Johnson and you know, or, you know, pick, you know, pick a politician from another party, you know, depending on your sort of political views. I shouldn't obviously assume what your views are by any means, but, you know, pick a pick a high profile, unpopular politician. And very often, at least in my experience, the, the people who say they don't like negative campaigning will have some quite negative things to say. So it, it's weird that we seem to compartmentalise our collective disdain for negative campaigning into quite a narrow sort of range of activity. And this was, I mean, this was particularly interesting during the 2015 general election, because that was an election where almost every party leader was very public, came out very publicly saying negative campaigning is horrible. All my camp, all my opponents are doing it. We are not doing it. And then in the same sentence, you would find them, you know, criticizing another party. So it's like that is that is, in fact, negative, negative campaigning. But but I think part of it is is negative campaigning can be factual, right? It can yeah. simply be contrasting your policy views with those of your opponent, right? You know, do you support the development of a, of a local housing, uh, a local, you know, housing development? Or, you know, do you support, you know, say a policy to provide assistance to certain groups of, of the community. I mean, those can just be factual. I mean, they can be factual statements, right? Not necessarily loaded. I mean, there's a difference between saying, you know, I support X and he supports Y and I support X and he supports Y and that makes him evil. So I think the former is, is it's there. They are negative campaigning, right? But it's not it's simply contrasting, you know, for voters. And actually, there's a great deal of research that suggests that negative campaigning can be better for informing voters because it provides them both sides of the story yeah. side by side, right? So they can see it. They don't have to go out and find out, well, I know that this candidate stands for X. What does this candidate stand for on that same issue? It's contrasted for yeah. them very, very, very clearly. Yeah. And, and I guess running through that is this question about how much should politics be about policies versus personalities? And, you know, there's the there, particularly people I think on the left in Britain, like there's a lovely quote from Tony Benn about how, you know, politics should be about policies, not personalities. But I think remember Charles Kennedy made this point really well when he was Liberal Democrat leader that the issues that came up in the 2001 general election bore almost no relationship to what were the big issues then in the subsequent parliament. Mm 
and that whilst it might have seemed the sort of the correct sort of purist idealized way of deciding how to vote in the 2001 election by looking at the different parties policies what you really needed to judge was the leaders values and their competence because that is how you might anticipate are they likely in these unexpected circumstances that come up are they likely to do things that I then agree with or or, or don't you know don't agree with and although that parliament I think particularly because of 9-11 was a little bit exceptional in terms of how much the political agenda shifted during it it's not you know it's not a massive outlier and I do think I think I do think there is a lot of value in that sense in focusing on the personalities. But I wonder, in terms of your research, you use negative campaigning as quite a broad catch-all that would probably include both the stuff that I've done and the stuff that I criticise others for doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so you're you're completely right. There's there's many different types of 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 negative campaigning, and and I would be the first to say that not all of them are created equal. Um, so we don't, uh, we don't in this paper, we don't differentiate between the different types of negativity, but that said, you know, in, in preparing the paper, we've uncovered lots of different types, right? So you could criticize a, a party either on their national positions, their local positions, you could consider, you could criticize an opposing party leader. Those types of, uh, of attacks have become consistently, significantly more common in leaflets, or you could, uh, you could, uh, you could criticize an opposing candidate. And that happens in two ways. You can either do it by without using their name, so my Tory opponents or the current MP, or you can actually target them by name. And so there's lots of different different ways that that we can approach that. And I think we one of the things that we've tried to do in a project that we're now working on is to really unpick this, right? So because I think it goes to the heart of what you're saying, is is all of this really negative? And do voters see this in the same way? And the answer is both yes and no. So in, in a new project that, that Alan and I are working on, um, we did an experiment with YouGov where we created um, fake leaflets modeled on real leaflets. And we look at different types <laughs> oh, Could of- I become one of your research assistants, please? Yeah. This sounds like <laughs> such a fun job to have. <laughs> So it's, 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 it's a really great way to, if, if academia doesn't work out for me, perhaps I have a future in, in campaigning. Um, <laughs> so we look at, um, we look at in, in this experiment, so we have the, the control, which is no negative messages. And then we create leaflets where a candidate attacks their opponent on policy, where they attack them on personal dimensions and where they do both. And, and, and what we find is, is that voters still think that policy criticism is negativity. So they still say it's negative, but it's perceived as you would expect to be less negative than criticizing your opponent on their personal attributes. So things like, do they live in the constituency, which is a very common criticism that, that candidates lob at, at each other. And one of the really interesting thing, things of this follow-up paper is we look at how these different types of negativity affect evaluations of both the attacker and the target of the attack. And we find that policy attacks really have no effect, right? So they don't affect how people rate the attacker mm-hmm. and they don't affect how people rate the target. But personal personal attacks, even where you don't mention the opponent by name, have have more of an effect. So respondents tended to rate the attacker more negatively. So they see them in a poor light and they tend to, to react more positively to the target. But the really interesting thing is that partisanship matters here. Mm. So partisanship, um, respondents who are, are partisans of either the attacker or the target really don't change their views, right? So you're not you're not really having an effect on people who already like you or don't like you as the case may be, but nonpartisans and partisans of other parties are much more likely to be to be be shaped by these negative attacks, particularly personal attacks, right? So they're more likely to be turned off. They rate the attacker more negatively and they're particularly likely to to perceive more fa- pa- favorably towards the target. So what does this mean? It means that negative campaigning may help you to kind of embed the feelings of your your partisans, but it may turn off the people that you need to persuade. So think about if you're in a marginal seat, mm. you, you've already won <clears throat> your own voters. Who you need to you need to pick up is nonpartisans and and people who are um, partisans of, of of perhaps other parties, right? So a really interesting. It does matter the type, and it can in fact have. Well, in theory, negative consequences. Wouldn't though, isn't that slightly in tension with your earlier finding that if if negative campaigning is much riskier 
for winning over the floating voter that you might expect it to be to appear less often in very marginal seats that you know you sort of roll the dice take the gamble mobilize your own supporters when you're a long way behind it so how yeah how do you reconcile that with with the point about marginality so i think i think there's there's two things so there's there's what we find in 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 academic research and there's kind of conventional wisdom right so there's things that people just know to be true even though you know academics don't find it i think the other point is that that much of the negativity that we observe, you know, anecdotally from looking at lots of leaflets tends to be policy based. So in this country, mm. it's policy criticisms, right? So I think, you know, if everyone was attacking their opponent on personal grounds, you know, there would be a tension there. Right? Mm. It would, in fact, be rebounding against them. And, and, and that's really important. On policy grounds, I mean, I think it's what we find is is people clearly believe it works, right? They think they need to do it in marginal seats. What we find is is maybe they don't, or maybe they need to do it on certain dimensions, right? So contrasting your your you know your political views or your policy views is is perhaps something that's beneficial, and it doesn't rebound on you, right? So I think that's a perhaps a, a way of kind of disentangling that. But we wanted to kind of pick up if you go negative on personal dimensions, does that does that make a difference? And is that different from the effects on policy? And the answer is yes. And how sort of wide is the sort of variance in that? Because I guess, you know, on average, personal negative campaigning having a, a backfire effect could mean that actually 99% of cases it has a backfire effect, in 1% of cases it works. Or it could actually mean that, you know, in maybe even two thirds of cases, it works, it works a bit. And in you know, a third of cases, it's quite counterproductive. You know, the, the what are what are, what are the odds? You know, within that overall average, what are the what are the odds that actually it might work? At least in in the in the experiments that you've tried. I, so, so I can give you kind of my my uh, my kind of mm. reading of the tea yeah. leaves, if you will, less on the data. But I mean, my view is it probably depends on what you say, mm. and and the extent to which what you say is perceived to be factual versus versus kind of personal even mm. if it's personal it's it, there's a difference right so i think i think you know pointing out that your opponent doesn't live in the constituency i mean there's lots of research that's showing that voters prefer local candidates obviously a candidate who's not local is not going to come out and say i live over in kent so I, I think we could say that that on certain dimensions, it could, you know, if we believe that that voters prefer local candidates, and there's lots of evidence that they do, that pointing out that that someone isn't local could perhaps, particularly in a marginal seat, be decisive at the margins, right? Depends on how marginal it is. You know, as you get really, really marginal, I mean, in some seats, changing the minds of 100 voters will change the outcome of the election. In others, you know, you would need to shift thousands. And so, you know... <clears throat> The margins and a marginal obviously depends on, on on the level. So I think there, there could be certain things. I mean, particularly pointing out something's local, where voters value that may have a big effect. I mean, other things like, you know, pointing out if you say someone is a career politician, that may be true. But how you phrase that mm. is it, it, it is it may, in fact, be perceived to be more kind of more negative, more mm. pejorative. So I think it's it's you know, I think you just have to be quite careful, I think, about how you, you know, how you tap into the, the types of characteristics that voters, voters really care about, and how you present, you know, your own positions versus versus your opponents. And, and, and where voters do care about those things, we would expect that, you know, flagging to them, if you want a local candidate, and you find out that someone is not local, well, that may cause you to vote yeah. for someone else and presumably there's a bit of a almost necessary limitation in the research that you're doing that you have to have an objective measure of what counts as negative or with you know if you're categorizing mm -hmm. messaging and you, know, you have to have some sort of objective measure and that means you can't really distinguish between the sorts of value judgments a lot of people will make. So to give you an example of, I don't know, let's compare, say, Dominic Raab and Therese Coffey. I think there is lots of reasonable, justifiable, etc. negative campaigning one can do about Dominic Raab's record, you know, the report into, you know, the allegations of bullying against him that 
one can get, I think, reasonably, and indeed in a democracy, perhaps even necessarily, quite negative and specific about his personal behaviour in a way that I think is fine. On the other hand, I'm sort of rather repelled when people sometimes attack Therese Coffey by circulating the photo of her looking rather the worse for wear with some drink, I presume it is, spilled on her top and smoking a cigar. And, you know, that is, well, so what? But in a way, I think from the point of view of your classification schema, you can't really distinguish between those, diff what to me, and I suspect to most listeners, feel like very different sorts yeah. of personal attacks. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a, a huge difference between criticizing Diane Abbott for having, a, you know, a drink, and and you know, cra criticizing policy views or what what she's written for mm. for the paper. So I think that's really important. I think the the distinction here, though, is 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 the types of negativity that we see in leaflets is is different from what you would see in the media. Yeah. Right. So I think that's kind of the distinction I would I would make, and and you know. If someone was going to criticize Dominic Rab and leaflets, they might be more careful than than you know people would what people would say on Twitter. And so I think what we've tried to do in this experiment, you're quite right that you know that's a limitation. There's there's all sorts of gradients about it. What we tried to do is really capture the types of negativity that people use in leaflets, right? So that we can really kind of isolate how how people respond to those that particular aspect of the campaign. But I think often, and I think in, in leaflets, people are much more cautious, given that there's you know legislation around what you you can say, but also about that that. The, the the issue that we touched on earlier, there's a reticence to be seen to do it. And in, in, in the case of Dominic Rao, you might say it's like shooting a fish in a barrel. Mm. So you might you could be quite diplomatic mm. in how you make a point about his, his record in that area without kind of being really kind of in your mm. face. And and most voters, you know, will pick yeah. up on that. And and I guess that's reflected often in say parliamentary by elections, which in some ways are maybe a uh... A, a little bit of a challenge for your findings because mm -hmm. a lot of parliamentary by-election campaigns do have quite a lot of negative content mm -hmm. in them in the you know the definition of negative that you're using but they do also often produce very large shifts in the vote even though there's relatively little national media coverage etc mm -hmm. so in that sense the it does seem like the message in the leaflets absolutely is having is managed to shift quite a large number of people through through that sort of messaging but your sort of classic negative leaflet from whichever party about, say, the, one of the other party's candidates will be full of quotes from the press and the like. So it's almost like sort of, you know, it's it, it, it's not a personal rant. It's here's what others are saying about them. And I guess that reflects your point around how the tone is really important. I, I also think it's it, it the tone is really important and also the focus on national versus local. And, you know, oftentimes, you know, I think we increasingly see in, in general elections, people often wish to to focus on the local, right, to, to, to really make it a, a discussion about, you know, what the candidate can bring locally. And, and whereas often by-elections can, can very much become a referenda on current, current national politics, right, um, as, as they kind of occur outside of the general yeah. The, the kind of the where everyone is competing so I think they are a little bit they are a little bit different but you're you're completely right I think the other the issue with with, with general uh, with by-elections that's probably really quite relevant is the people who vote vote in by-elections often are very different than than the the people who vote in general elections and that you tend to get you know lower turnout people are more engaged you know kind of kind of flag to that and and those are also the people who are more likely to read leaflets you know really closely so I think we, we we kind of get interesting patterns there where perhaps campaigns can have more effects and and you know the extent to which candidates can push on a, an open door you know if a, if a party is perceived to be you know kind of incompetent in governance or this issue around that they can push very hard on that in a kind of negative way which may have greater effect yeah and I, one issue that we that came up when we last spoke was you had some really interesting findings on the difference between political leaflets produced for male candidates and for female candidates. And actually, we talked a little bit as well about whether that was to do with the candidate or the agent and so on. So I'll include in the show notes a link to the previous podcast on which we discussed that. But did you find any difference between male and female candidates on negative campaigning? Because that feels like there are a lot of 
stereotypes that one might expect points to there perhaps being some differences, but but actually in reality are there? Yes. So so this isn't an issue that we Ooh, for the stereotypes um, then. It, well, it, there are differences. Um, stereotypes often come from somewhere. We call them heuristics in <laughs> in, in political science because it sounds nicer, but the, the point is the same, right? Yeah. So I mean. W- we, what we find in, in this paper is that, to, on average, female candidates are less likely to use negative ma- messaging. This accords kind of quite nicely with with kind of previous research, where we find that female candidates are less likely to talk about themselves. I would say it it's it's almost as though they use safer campaign tactics, mm. and and more so they're less likely to to kind of talk about their personal attributes. They're less likely likely to to criticize their opponents. And so so we really need to unpick a bit more about why that is. You know, why are women less likely to talk about being a local candidate when they are in fact a local candidate? Mm. And and that's something I think, you know, we, you know, we find really quite interesting. And also there's something for for candidates to learn in, in our research, which is really like you you need to, you know, if you have these traits, you know, there is research that shows that voters want this, right? If you have it, don't be afraid to use it. The same could be true of, of, of negative campaigning. But yeah, it, it, it is really quite an interesting. We do see gender dynamics in terms of kind of what type of tactics they're prepared to use. And, and that's really something that we hope to explore more and more detail going down the line. Yeah, I, I, I guess negative campaigning in a way is a way of sort of trying to stand out a bit and so I, I guess there's an interesting analogy perhaps or parallel with the different views people have and the different advice you know aspiring female MPs again across parties have been given at different times about in a sense whether you uh, you know to put it at its simplest whether you should dress in really bright clothes to stand out as you are something different from the stereotypical image brackets of male of politicians or whether in a sense you should choose uh, to try to blend in and certainly I wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be my position to sort of tell tell women, female politicians which of those is the right or the wrong answer. But I do just sort of observe that views seem to vary quite a lot as to which of those two is the preferable, you know, and, and more effective route. And but 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 it's it, it sounds like on the if you sort of apply that same logic to leafleting, that the overall pattern is very much the sort of try not to draw attention to yourself, try to take the lower key blend in route. Well, it's, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting thought experiment, right? Because, you know, as, as, as a woman who, who leads a a group of people, you know, female leaders are often perceived to, if they're assertive to be, you know, it's, it's, is assertive, you know, in a female leader perceived Mm. to be a good thing, sometimes not. A woman is aggressive where a man is strong. And I think that that can be quite an interesting, you know, it can be a quite an interesting d- dilemma for a female candidate as is for, for, for female leaders in business as well, is, is you know, how to, you know, how to, uh, what types of tactics to adopt, right? Do you, do you, you know, do you want to, there's lots of research from, from the United States where do women, you know, act more like you know, adopt male kind of approaches. Yeah. Does that rebound on them? Mm-hmm. Really interesting thing about how do you talk talk about your family, right? Mm-hmm. Male co- candidates may find there's a benefit into mentioning their, you know, their children being in, in kind of local schools and, and where where women are less likely to discuss their families, right? Because that may be perceived as being a conflict on your time. Mm-hmm. You don't have enough time to be a representative. So there's lots yes, of it's that, it's that horrible biased view that yep. <laughs> being a mother is a distraction and being a father is a positive attribute. It's positive, yeah. And I think that's, I mean, you know, those those biases exist, right? And, 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 and mm. you know, we need to be mindful of that in, in kind of how we de- de- how we design campaigns. But I think that's changing, right? I think those views, you know, we more women are are owning the kind of strong women and and you know being a mother while being in parliament so i think we're think, seeing those those things change as we see them change in, in in all aspects of 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 business but yes it's 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 very it's a very difficult it's likely to be a very difficult consideration for a female candidate is how to present that and, and perhaps we might be unsurprised that they choose to adopt a safer approach yeah Although we should remember, I always I always find in that sense political science really weird in this respect, that women are the majority of the electorate. And for all sorts of 
sadly very understandable historic reasons. The default is normally we talk about the electorate or we talk about candidates and then we talk about women as the sort of the bit that's different. But actually, you know, the women are the majority. That I, and I, I can't think of, you know, so it's very common to have to find political science books that are about, say, the electorate in some way or about an election. And then there'll be a chapter on the women's vote. I, but the women are the majority of the voters. And I can't think of any other circumstance in which you have to have a special chapter or section uh, about the majority. You know, there, there's something still very imbalanced that's sort of deeply, deeply built into our politics, unfortunately. But I, I wonder also, though, whether to some extent there is a question here about who is artworking the leaflets and so on. And because I think certainly in the Liberal Democrats, I don't know how true this is of other parties, uh, where it's, for example, being done by staff, those are often relatively low paid, long hours jobs that are pretty incompatible with, for example, other caring responsibilities. Oh. And as a result, because of all of the other biases in society, it's quite a male dominated group of people. And so the choices about what's going in a leaflet for a female candidate, obviously, she will have some say and influence over that absolutely but it may be that it's a man who's actually making second guessing in that sense when they're first drafting the leaflet as to what but i suspect your answer on that is is still the same as the last time we spoke that one day you would love to be able to delve further into into those sorts of other issues behind the leaflets that's certainly true. I mean, I think there's there's much to be understood about, you know, how, you know, the the, the intermarriage, the, we've got voters, we've got campaigners, and we've got candidates, right? Mm -hmm. and, and all of these things kind of work together, and there's biases in all of them. And I think you're completely right. I do intend to study this in future research, but I think there's still much to be understood about why, you know, why female candidates fundamentally behave differently. And in, in fact, in some cases, don't say the things that we would expect them to say. So why don't they, why don't they like to, you know, why don't they mention their local connections when, when, when they have them? So I think, and that can't easily be explained by the fact that it, it would maybe a male campaigner making that leaflet because surely they would want to mention those things. So I think there's, there's still a lot of really interesting things that we can understand about local campaigns and, and leaflets, which is why I intend to spend the next few decades continuing to study them. Mm. Yeah. And if you ever want a little case study on some of these issues, I think it's very striking that in the Lib Dems amongst the sort of party's campaign staff, professional campaign staff, 20 years ago, almost nobody was a parent. And now I think the, the mix of campaign staff is a bit more diverse in terms of male and female, not nearly as much progress made in terms of diversity on some other attributes. But what is much it's pretty normal now for, 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 for a member of that sort of campaign staff team to be a parent in a way that was I suspect that must have had some knock-on effect hopefully in a good way in terms of how the campaigning's done but yeah that might be a fascinating thing to try and look at a longitudinal study how lived in leaflets have or haven't been influenced by the spread of parents behind the scenes <laughs> but having said all that if any listeners are thinking oh this is fascinating research really looking forward to the next thing or oh my goodness this research is all wrong it's nothing like what happens in leaflets that got in my area what's the way that people can help because you can people can submit leaflets to your archive for use in future analysis can't they Yes, and this is obviously going to become really important because there should be a general election anytime soon. So like all good cephologists, we're eagerly waiting for the next general election. Um, this is <laughs> Not sure <laughs> eagerly so... is, is <laughs> you, you and your team are at least. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, this will be the first general election where we've had the open elections platform during the campaign, mm. right? So, you know, this is a citizen science project, yeah. right? So it's powered by citizens and voters. So, so I would say, please upload your leaflets that you get from any party. You can do it right to our website. You can send them to us at openelections.nottingham.ac. Everything that we do, all of our research is is powered by by voters, right? So if it's not right, send us your leaflets and we'll look at them. And the more leaflets we get, the more accurate picture that we get of what our politics are, the way our politics are unfolding at the local level. So yes, please participate in our research and help us get a better picture of, 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 of politics. Brilliant. Thank you, Caitlin. I will include a link to the website in the show notes. And that's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. I, I I guess my final question would be what's what's next? What will mm. what can we look forward to appearing next and maybe asking you back on the podcast to discuss mm. in due course? 
what is next? So the next, obviously, the next big piece of work is going to be around the gender election. So one of the things that we're really interested in doing is providing real-time analysis. So at the moment, we're really telling you about what's happened in the past. Um, our, our next big piece of work and, and most of the, the, the kind of what we're focusing on the moment is, is thinking about how are we going to provide information to voters during the campaign? Mm. Because what we really want to do and the goal of this project is always to provide transparency mm. at a time when voters need to make decisions, right? So how can we tell them what parties are saying, where they're saying it, where they're, how they're using criticism, how they're talking about their local, their local, their local connections? And also for candidates, right? So to say, if we can say to them, look, like your opponent is talking about their local, local connections and you're not, that actually gives candidates the ability to change the, the, you know, the trajectory of their, their, their literature at a point where it can still make a difference, right? So what we're going to be focusing on the next couple of years is really thinking about how we can um, provide real-time analysis to help people make more informed, uh, more informed decisions. Excellent. I look forward to that. So in between Lib Dems delivering lots of leaflets at the next election, hopefully lots of listeners and indeed long Lib Dem listeners as well will be busy uploading those leaflets to your website. So thank you hugely for that. It's been really interesting talk. Listeners can find Caitlin on Twitter at Caitlin Milazzo, which is M-I-L-A-Z-Z-O. And you can find myself on Twitter at Mark Pack and this podcast at Bar Chart Podcast. And as I said, look out in the show notes for follow-up links to what we've discussed, including how to upload leaflets yourself. And if you like listening, please do tell others about this podcast and give it a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. Thank you, everyone, for listening. (music) 